My name is Mike, and this is the Hot Seat. On the Hot Seat today, Libertarianism versus Conservatism. And folks, there's a huge difference. This is probably the most important Hot Seat I've done yet. And folks, I urge you to listen to this in its entirety. I want to thank Tom Mullen for this tremendous article. It woke me up, and I've included the link in the description field. People are referring to Ron Paul as a modern-day Thomas Jefferson, and rightfully so. It was libertarians like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams who founded this country. Libertarians believe that people should be left alone, be able to do whatever they want to do. Government should keep our taxes down, keep our regulations low, and that we shouldn't get involved in the bedroom, Rick Santorum. We shouldn't get involved in cultural issues. That is not how traditional conservatives view the world. Libertarians believe in the founding principles of the United States, including the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They believe that these rights are endowed by their creator. In other words, they pre-exist the government. They are not created by the government. It is the government's one and only job to protect those rights, and when the government fails to protect them, and instead violates them, it is the duty of the people to alter or abolish that government. Do you hear what I'm saying, folks? For Jefferson, whose philosophy was inspired by John Locke, the reason that men formed government was to protect these rights better than they could be protected otherwise. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obligates everyone and reason which is that law teaches all mankind who will but consult it that believe all equal and independent. No one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. At Jefferson's inaugural, he's quoted, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuit of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government, and this is necessary to close the circle of our felicities. This is very Ron Paul-like today. In a letter to Francis Walker Gilmer in 1816, Jefferson wrote, Our legislatures are not sufficiently apprised of the rightful limits of their powers that their true office is to declare and enforce only our natural rights and duties and to take none of them from us. No man has a natural right to commit aggression on the equal rights of another, Barack Obama, and this is all from which the laws ought to restrain him. On religious freedom, Jefferson based his position on the non-aggressive principle. The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as they're injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Libertarians that led the secession from Great Britain, the word liberty, as used in the Declaration of Independence, has a specific definition. It meant the right to do what one pleases as long as one does not invade the life, liberty, or property of another human being. In other words, each individual was beyond the reach of government power so long as he committed no aggression against anyone else. These are not conservative ideas. They are libertarian ideas. While Jefferson, Samuel Adams, and the others who espoused this theory may not have called themselves by that name. The basic tenets of their philosophy were the same. Today, the non-aggression axiom remains the fundamental basis for libertarian theory. 
Ron Paul bases his positions on it. As he said, when running for president on the Libertarian Party ticket in 1988. Libertarian foreign policy. As all nations exist in a state of nature with each other, the natural law of non-aggression is the only one that governs them. Again, very Ron Paul-like. The Declaration of War Power. The purpose of that power is for Congress to debate whether or not the nation in question has actually committed aggression against the United States. If it has, then a state of war exists and military action is justified. If it hasn't, there is no state of war, no declaration, and no military action is justified. The use of military force in the absence of a state of war, previous aggression by another nation, violates this natural law. The conservative philosophy rejects all of these ideas. 18th century conservatives mirrors today's brand. The writer that most modern conservatives trace their phil philosophical ideas is to Edmund Burke. He, he has this to say about inalienable rights. Government is not made in virtue of natural rights. Among these wants is to be reckoned the want out of civil society, of a sufficient restraint upon their passions. Society requires not only that the passions of individuals should be subjected, but that even the mass and body, as well as in the individuals, the inclinations of men should frequently be thwarted, their will controlled, and their passions brought into subjection. Does this not sound like both parties? Does this not sound like what Barack Hussein Obama wants to do and what Rick Santorum wants to do? Thomas Hobbes. For Hobbes, as for true conservatives today, Man has to give up his natural rights upon entering society and accept those privileges to liberty and property that the government grants them. For Hobbes, not only did man give up his natural rights upon entering society, but he also had to grant the sovereign absolute and undivided power. This was necessary in order to completely dominate man's natural impulses, which would always lead him to harm his neighbor if they were not checked. But of course this theory is flawed, because there is more harm than good in stripping liberties and promoting tyranny. To secure this absolute power, the sovereign needed control over the economy, which he consolidated through a privileged, wealthy elite. Sounds like the Federal Reserve, doesn't it? He has also needed control over education and even the religious beliefs of the people. No individual could ever be allowed to follow the dictates of his own will, as it would inevitably lead to harm his neighbor or the commonwealth in general. Does this sound like Ron Paul? No, it doesn't. The reason that conservatism seeks to conserve the status quo is because its adherents do not believe that natural rights are inalienable. Upon entering society, man has to give up all of his natural rights. So the only rights that man has in society are those that has been given to him by the government in the past. Thus, if you get rid of the past, you get rid of the rights. While the status quo might not be optimal, the conservative believes that to get rid of the status quo means returning to the awful state of nature and necessitates reconstructing man's rights via government all over again. 
conservatives are always fearful that their rights can be lost and never regained, as opposed to libertarians who believe their rights are inalienable. The conservative tradition in America traces back to Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists, who were the conservatives of their day. Hamilton sought to preserve the status quo, which was a central government with absolute power, along with its mercantilist economic system. The only change he sought was that the system be run by Americans rather than the British. Hamilton was a Hobbesian on every issue, which is why he clashed so stridently with Jefferson and Adams. Hamilton also believed that the power of the federal government had to be absolute. Otherwise, the separate states would be in a state of nature with each other and inevitably at war. Economically, he wanted a central bank. High protectionist tariffs to enrich domestic manufacturers at taxpayers' expense. And international improvements, which meant the government using taxpayer money to build what we would call today infrastructure. Sounds very Obamian, doesn't it? With the railroads and all that crap. While all of these policies were anti-free market, they served the agenda of securing the loyalty of a wealthy elite to the government. Hamilton went so far as to call the national debt a national blessing for that same reason. Conservatives on foreign policy. Conservatives support the deployment of troops all over the world. Like Hobbes, they believe that we are in constant danger from any nation that we are not completely dominating with the threat of force. On foreign policy, Hamilton was an unqualified militarist who sought to lead an army in conquering an American empire, starting with the Western Hemisphere possessions of Spain. He felt justified in all of these invasions of individual rights and violations of non-aggression because he believed that what he called National greatness, today's conservatives call it American exceptionalism, trumped the rights of individuals. For Hamilton, as for conservatives throughout human history, the individual lived to serve the commonwealth, as opposed to the libertarian belief that the commonwealth only existed to serve the individual. Here is the crucial mistake American voters make regarding Republican conservatism. Today, conservative American voters wonder why the Republican re politicians that they elect never seem to make the government smaller or less intrusive. They refer to elected Republicans who can consistently grow the size and power of the government as rhinos. Republicans in name only. They believe these politicians are not true conservatives because while they may belong to the Republican Party, they don't adhere to the principles of an underlying conservative philosophy that they imagine, imagine to exist. They are wrong. Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, George Bush, and the rest of the establishment Republicans are the true conservatives. The American voters identifying themselves as conservatives are really libertarians. They just don't know it yet. It was libertarianism that made America different from any society before or since. It was the collectivist conservative philosophy that helped bring it down. With a lot of help from a third-party philosophical movement called progressivism, neither more conservatism nor more progressivism nor any combination of the two can solve the problems that America faces today. If Americans want to see liberty and prosperity restored in the United States, then restoring libertarianism is their only hope. 
Ignorance and denial is no longer an option. Neither is surrender. We the people are obligated to change government. The beauty of this country is that we do not have to begin with violence. Our goal should be to rid Washington, D.C. of these tyrannical men and women by 2016 through third party voting. Revolt with the vote. My name is Mike, and this is the hot seat.